My goal tonight will try will be to uh, give you an idea about what is particle physics. We'll try to make that as simple as possible to give you a sense of what we do as particle physicists, looking at what we have achieved so far and then looking at in the future what is uh, left to do. And you know, London is the capital city of uh, musicals and I had uh, the occasion to see my first musical on Saturday night, the Tina show. It was absolutely mesmerizing. And I don't know if we'll be able to do something as entertaining here tonight, but I'll certainly do my best. So, um, the outline for the talk tonight, first will be particle physics in a nutshell, how it works, then what is the Higgs boson? I know you've all heard something about it, but if you have to describe it, it might be something else. So i say a few words to help you better understand what it does. Uh, oops, sorry. And uh, why do we bother to look for those particles? That's a good question. And what is left to do, because there are lots of students here, and uh, it's not much fun when you, you realize that we have already done all the jobs, but you'll see, we are far from there. So the aim of particle physics is quite simple, is to find out what are the smallest constituent of matter. We want to know what are the building bricks of matter. And if we were in Copenhagen, that's where Lego bricks were invented in Denmark. And there is a museum in the, called Legoland, and there everything is made of Lego bricks. So if someone there was to ask me, what what are the smallest constituent of matter? It'd be easy, you know, when nobody watches, I will take one of the exhibits, I would break it apart, and I will see all the fundamental particles coming out of it, all the building bricks. But Lego bricks is not so simple because they have more now, more than 3,700 different fundamental bricks. But when we, when we look at, um, so at Legoland, these are the smallest constituent of matter. But when we look at real matter, like a piece of wood, our body, this room, everything, the stars and galaxies, it's not so simple because you know it's made of atoms, but the atoms are so small, we don't see them. So it's not so easy. Uh, an atom is, in fact, a million times smaller than a human hair. So it's really not big. It's 10 to the minus 10 meter. So a meter is a yard, roughly, and 10 to the minus 10 is the scientific notation. So you take the decimal point and you move it by 10 position. So instead of being uh, one, it's 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.00, 0, 0, 0, you insert nine zeros in there, and so that's the size. So it's 10 billionth of a meter. An atom, as you know, is made, sorry, I'll backtrack. An atom is made of uh, a nucleus and some electrons that gravitate around it. If I was a nucleus, my electrons would be 12 miles apart. So most of an, an, uh, an atom is, in fact, emptiness, vacuum. The nucleus itself is quite small. It's 10, uh, 10 to the minus 14. It means 10,000 times smaller than an atom. And inside the nucleus, you find protons and neutrons. I think up to here, you have probably all heard this. So the protons and the neutrons themselves, they are much smaller. Uh, they're about um, 10 to the minus 15, I believe. And inside the protons and the neutrons, you will find quarks. And the quarks are smaller than 10 to the minus 19 meters. So if I ask you now, what are the smallest constituent of matters that you see there that we cannot break any further? Which ones do you see? Quarks, yeah, and? Electron, that's it. So those are the only fundamental particles there, electrons and quarks. 
I show you that with just two types of quarks, two different types of quarks, the up quarks and the down quarks, I can build and electrons, I can build all the matter that we see here on Earth, stars and galaxies. See, if you take an up quark, an up quark has an electric charge equivalent to two thirds of the charge of an electron, but it's positive. And a down quark has a, ne a negative uh, charge and it corresponds to one third of the charge of an electron. So, if I want to make a positively charged particle, then I can take two up quarks, uh, two thirds of a, the charge of an electron twice, so it's four thirds, and I add to that a down quark, and then I get two plus one. So that's the charge of a proton. And so with up and down quarks, could you make up a particle that is neutral? Yes. Yeah? Who said yes? Okay, so what do you do? Voila. Two down quarks and one up quark. So that's what a neutron is made of. Okay, very simple. And you know that the whole periodic table, the only difference from one element to the next, like the lightest one is up here, the uh, hydrogen, it has only one proton in its nucleus and one electron around. The next one is helium. All you do to change uh, electric element, you just add one proton to the nucleus. So helium has two uh, protons, two neutrons for stability, and two electrons around. The, the third one is lithium, and there you have three protons, and so on and so forth. So you see, you can build all the 119 of those elements just by putting more protons in the, in the nucleus. And that's the difference between the different uh, uh, elements that we find in the periodic table. So that's it. With up quarks, down quarks, I've just built all type of chemical elements and you know that everything that we have on Earth is made of those elements. It was my dream when I was uh, about 14 and in 1969 when they went on the, the uh, it was which one? Apollo 9 mission that went on the, on the moon? 11? Apollo. <laughs> of by two, possibly. Apollo 11, and they went on, on the moon, and I was hoping they would find new elements. Man, no. They found the same ele chemical elements that were here. And uh, so, uh, um, so in the, in the 60s, it was really uh, difficult because we had hundreds of different particles. Today, there are two, more than 230 different particles that are listed in this little booklet with all their properties. And now we know that it's not so complex. At first, you can have a look at that. You can pass it around. At first, people didn't understand why there were so many. And it's far from being for, like uh, the Lego bricks with more than 3,700 different pieces. Today, we know that it's very simple. And it's so simple that we, we can make it even simpler than the periodic table. And that's what we call the standard model. The standard model is just a theoretical um, model to help us classify the particles. And it tells us it has two principles. The first principle is that all matter is made of particles. All matter can be broken down into the elementary particles. And it tells us that there are in fact 12 different particles. These particles come in two families, the family of leptons and the family of hadrons, the ones that are built out of quarks, like protons and neutrons are in the family of hadrons. I'm a Gagnon, they are hadron, you know, just a family name. So I already introduced the up and down quarks for the quarks. Those are the lightest one. And then there is the charm and the strange quark. Strange quark got its name because all the particles that contain that quark were having a very strange lifetime, which was much longer than all the other particles that we knew before. So it was called the strange quark. The next one came that was a discovered next quark. Then people saw, why not? The charm quark. This one had charm. And then they went for truth and beauty, but then, no, 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 no. We said, okay, enough of that. And we called it, 
we can't, we can't the, the true T for top and beauty B for the uh, bottom quark. So now we have the top and bottom quarks. So the top quark is the heaviest of all the particles, and it's, it's quite heavy. So that's the family of uh, quarks, and uh, hadrons, and the family of leptons, you know the electron. There is also, the electron also come with a muon, uh, with, sorry, with a neutrino. When we create uh, electrons in the laboratory, often, it often, it's always uh, produced either with an anti-electron or a neutrino. All these particles that you see here are, also have their antimatter. So particles that are identical except that all their quantum charges are inverted. Like they have, um, their spin will be inverted, they will spin in the other direction, their electric charge will be positive for a positron instead of uh, the electron which is negative. Okay, so the, in the family of leptons we have the electron, then the muon which is 200 times heavier but similar to an electron, and it also comes with its neutrino. And finally, the tau particle, which is 4,000 times heavier than the electron, and it also comes with a neutrino. And I brought one here, and those are the, so now you know that it's real. <laughs> and so, this, uh, this, uh, this series of little uh, characters come from the particle zoo, and it's a young woman, uh, uh, Julie uh, Paisley from California, who attended the lecture like this one day, and then she thought it was cute, and she was a seamstress, so she started producing the particle zoo, and you can, uh, you can order them on the web. So I can pass the tau neutrino, <laughs> and what is really weird, it's like, you know, we have a construction set, but the only particles that we need to build everything that we see on Earth and in the universe is the first generation of particles, up quarks, down quarks, electrons. It's like I'm giving you a, a very nice construction set at uh, Christmas time, and it has all sorts of models that you can uh, build, but in all those things, you never use the second and third generation. It's like you have the basic particles, up and down quarks, and then the other ones, they don't fit their Duplos, they're not Lego. And that, that, it doesn't fit together. So it's a funny construction set, because the tau muon, uh, the tau uh, lepton, is 4,000 times bigger than the electron. So it's a very weird construction set, and you never use it. So it's strange, that's one thing that we don't understand. But we know now that there are these 12 basic particles and their antimatter, their antiparticle. The second principle of the standard model says that matter is made of uh, fundamental particles and they interact with each other by exchanging other particles that we call bosons, and those particles mediate the forces between those particles. And the first one that is there is the gluon. That's what you find that will glue, hence the name, that will glue the quarks together to form protons and neutrons, for example. So those are gluons. Then you have the photon, which is associated with the electromagnetic force. So here is a photon. And you have, which is massless, then you have the W and Z bosons, which are the mediators of the weak nuclear force, which is way um, uh, stronger than, uh, a bit, a bit uh, weaker than the strong interaction between quarks and the uh, gluons. And that's the process that takes place on the sun, in the sun, uh, and how the sun burns its energy. Graviton, we haven't found it yet, but we have found, uh, about 10 years ago, we found the, the first uh, gravitational uh, waves, so we think that they will probably come with a graviton. And finally, the Higgs boson, Ta -da! the Higgs boson, which recently got discovered 10 years ago at CERN, and I will talk more about that. Here's the Higgs boson, and you notice the difference. This one has mass. What is this business of exchanging particles, those bosons? It works like this, like imagine two particles, like 
two skaters that are evolving, you know, skating on the ice, and they ignore each other. They don't know that the other one is there. Then they do their own business. And they would go on a straight line, but the first one, Nasty, tosses a heavy ball at the second one and makes him deviate. And she himself will recoil. So both of them are recoiling. So instead of continuing like this, they will recoil and then they change their tra trajectory. So see, if I was to look at that from far away, I would say, oh, look at that, there is a strange interaction at a distance that took place. No, 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 that's not. They simply exchange a heavy boson and it made them recoil. So that's how particles interact with each other. It's by exchanging the various bosons associated with forces. So that's all there is to the standard model in terms of uh, principles. Everything is made of particles. All matter is made of particles. And those particles exchange interact with each other by exchanging bosons. Okay, so the situation was much clearer than having those 230 different particles that we didn't know what they were made of and all that. But in the 60s, there was a, pro a major problem is that all the equations that come with the standard model predicted particles that were massive. But all of them in the equations were coming out with massless particles. All the particles were massless. So the model was describing things properly, but all those particles in these equations were massless. And we knew, we had measured that in the laboratory, we knew that they had a mass. So it was difficult to understand. So a bunch of theorists were all working independently uh, these two were together, François uh, Angler and Robert Braut, two uh, Belgian uh, physicists, and they, they were the first ones to propose a new field. They said that our universe was permeated by this field that was, and through this field, particles could acquire mass, okay? Strangely enough, those names were, until recently, not very well known, but everybody has heard now the name of uh, Peter Higgs. Why is he uh, well known? Because he was the second one to publish similar ideas, and he sent his paper to a news, uh, uh, to, to a journal, a uh, physics journal, and the editor uh, rejected this paper saying, useless theory. <laughs> you don't make any practical uh, prediction with your theory. So, useless. Higgs was bummed out. So he said, oui, mais it comes with a new boson. And so he, he modified his paper a little bit and submitted it to another uh, journal. And then it got published. And he was the first one to mention that this new field would come associated with a new boson, like the little Higgs boson that is going around right now. So with this, so that's why the... The name stuck being the boson, uh, Higgs boson. And what they, they proposed in their theory was a mechanism to explain how particles would acquire mass. And, uh, but this required that we would introduce a new field. And that particles would acquire mass by interacting with this field. Okay. Now let's try to look at those concepts one after the other and get somewhere. What is a field? Bon. In physics, it has nothing to do with that kind of a weed field. It's more like a magnetic field. You know, if you put a magnet somewhere, it will simply change the properties of the uh, space around it such that any, any, uh, anything that is easily, uh, that is uh, reacting to the magnetic force will behave differently. For example, if I have a magnet here, and I put a, a, a piece of plastic, and then I sh with a salt shaker, I put some iron filing on it. All the little pieces of uh, uh, iron filing will align themselves around, in the direction of the magnetic field line around the, the magnet. So those iron filings grains will all behave differently in the pre presence 
of a magnetic field. When there is a gravitational field, we stick to the ground. You know, we don't float around. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now I, I will go and introduce three concepts that we use in the physics. Mass. What is mass? Mass is the resistance to the change of your state of motion. So say that you are a huge uh, cruise ship like this, and it's, uh, it's in motion. If you want to stop it, it will take a lot of energy because it has a lot of mass. So to, uh, it will offer resistance to the change of its state of motion. Likewise, when you want to put it in uh, motion. And energy and mass are equivalent. The equivalence between energy and mass is uh, well known with this equation, is represented by this equation, E equals mc squared. You've all heard that equation at some point. E represents the energy and m the mass. C squared is simply the square of the speed of light, and that's the conversion factor between energy and mass. This equation tells me that I can take energy and produce matter, mass, out of it. That's what we do at CERN when we concentrate a lot of energy with the accelerator in one tiny point and we make new particles appear there. And you can take a, a mass, material, and you can uh, break it apart in a nuclear reactor and produce energy. So the two are equivalent. You can, see, you can look at mass like being congealed energy. Okay? And mass and energy are just two different uh, manifestations of the same essence. Like here, you know, I live in Germany, so I have euros in my pocket normally. I'm here today, so I have pounds, but I don't know why, because everybody only uses credit cards, so <laughs> it's totally useless. But anyway, so I have pounds and euros, and there is a conversion factor. So it's, it's not the same thing, but they represent the same essence, which is money. And there is a agreed upon exchange rate between the two. And that's the same between energy and matter and mass. Third concept, energy conservation. Energy can take different form, but must always be conserved. You cannot just lose energy like this. So if, if I represent energy with a, a fluid that I have in a, a bottle, I can then take my quantity of energy here and pour it in two different containers, but the total amount of fluid that I have at the beginning will always be the same. Well, just don't have to spill. It's okay. You're not allowed to spill, that's the thing. For a fundamental particle that is moving, there is only two ways that it has energy. It has energy due to its motion, kinetic energy, and it has energy, congealed energy, in its mass. Okay? Okay, ready? Here is how the Brout and Lert Higgs field gives mass to fundamental particles. Let's go back a little bit back in time, at the time just after the Big Bang. But we don't have much time. It lasted less than 10 to the minus 25, 30 seconds, where there was absolutely no Brout and Lert Higgs field then. There was no time, there was nothing before the Big Bang, I'm told. I wasn't there. But, <laughs> so imagine that a particle wants to go from point A to point B, there is no Brout and Lert Higgs field, and then uh, the space is empty and the particle can go from A to B on a straight line at the speed of light because it's massless. Huh? So only massless particles can travel at the speed of light. Okay, I'll do it slower so you can see. So it's going on a straight line. So for this particle, which is massless, all its energy is in the form of motion, kinetic energy. It has no mass. So the mass container is empty. But something like, I, sorry, I forgot, it was 10 to the minus 32 seconds shortly after the Big Bang, someone or something turned on the Brout and Lerd Higgs field. 
And now the space, the, uh, the properties of the space were modified. And it made it like, it's like, a, in the previous case, it's like a kid wants to go across the schoolyard, and when the schoolyard is empty, the kid can easily run at full speed in this, on a straight line. But if that kid is trying to cross the schoolyard when all the kids are out at uh, recess, then it will start interacting, you know, saying hello to the friends and bumping into each other, and it no longer goes on a straight line. It interacts with the space around it. It stopped getting its feet cut in the carpet, in the flowers of the carpet, like my grandmother would say. So you've noticed this particle is not going as fast as it was before. So it has less kinetic energy. You all agree with me? Where did the missing energy go? Yes, that's it. So this particle acquired mass by interacting with the Braut and Lerd Higgs field. Ta-da! That's how it works. And it's only this way that the particle would transform some of its energy into mass. Then you will have congealed energy in the form of mass. It's sometimes the, uh, an image that is given is that it's like the, the space becomes viscous and the particle cannot move so easily. It's good for an analogy, but then uh, viscosity is something that is dispersive and you would lose energy by friction. And that's not the case here. Did you notice that I haven't said a word yet about the Higgs boson in that whole story? So Braut and Glert and Higgs independently, all came up with the same idea, and the three other guys who were on the picture that I forgot to mention, that there was this, uh, this field that permeated the whole universe soon after the Big Bang. And we could say that the broad and glared Higgs field is, we could make an analogy with the surface of the ocean. And you know that uh, we can excite the surface of the ocean either with the wind, or an earthquake, a tsunami, and then you can produce waves. So the Higgs boson is like that. It's just a wave at the surface of the Braut and Glert Higgs field. Now you will all ask me, where did I get my drugs? You know, it's pretty good to come up with those things. <laughs> no, it's pretty far off. But that's the way it is. Wave are, waves are excitations of the ocean surface and the Higgs bosons are excitations uh, of the Braut and Glert Higgs field. We can create Higgs bosons by exciting the Braut and Glert Higgs field. Of course, you can uh, all say, come on, no, she's full of it. What is this? And so, to prove it to you, it's like, imagine that I have an aquarium here. And I tell you, the aquarium is full of water. Can you see the water? No. Okay. So to convince him and all of you, what I can do is easy. I can tap on the side of the aquarium. What happens? You see little ripples. Huh? Did you see it? <laughs> okay. No good drugs for him. So, okay. So all that we had to do, us, particle physicist experimentalist at CERN was to go and excite the canvas of the universe to make Higgs boson. And that's what, we, that's what we did. But how did we excite the fabric of the universe? You know, that's the job we were given. Okay, go and excite the fabric of the universe. Sure. <laughs> what time would you like that? And so what we did was to do it with the Large Hadron Collider. And this is a very energetic machine that can put a lot of energy in one tiny point in space, and this energy can uh, resonate with the fabric of the universe, and then when you just give it the right energy, like a string of guitar, will, st will start to vibrate. That's exactly what happened. So the Large Hadron Collider is built 
at CERN. CERN is the largest uh, particle uh, physics uh, laboratory in the, in the world. It's near Geneva uh, in Switzerland. And it's very large. It's 17 miles in circumference, 27 kilometers around. And you don't see anything, but the four experiments uh, are built along this uh, tunnel, but 100 meters underground, so 100 yards underground. And there we have huge caverns that have been excavated and a tunnel that looks pretty much like a subway tunnel in which we have a vacuum pipe and we have protons that are accelerated at the near the speed of light. It's at 99.99997% of the speed of light. And we have the particles, uh, the protons that circulate in the, the accelerator like that, 27 kilometers. And then they come and they collide. We bring them into collisions. And then of this collision, the energy materializes and produces new particles. So we have two types of tools to work at CERN. We have accelerators that accelerate particles, and we have detectors, and guess what they do? They detect the particles that come out of it. So we produce those collisions, new particles form right there, but they're very unstable, they break apart, and they create like mini fireworks, and all the fragments fly apart, and they go through the different layers of our detector, which are huge cylinders with end caps, and it goes through all the layers and leaving signals everywhere, and then we can tell that, yes, we saw something. It, it looks like a, a mini firework, and we're trying to catch all the fragments that come out, and then we, we can... Uh, reconstruct what was created at the first, uh, to start with, and then analyze what kind of uh, particles can be produced and how do they decay and all that. And from, from that, we infer the various laws of, uh, that these particles follow. So here is how it works with this uh, accelerator. So protons are put in a tiny uh, accelerator at the beginning, they gain enough energy, they go to the next stage, which is about 630 yards around, and then they go in a larger one that is about five miles around, and they gain more energy at each step until they get in the LHC, 27 kilometers or 17 miles, and they go and circulate. They go through this uh, vacuum pipe accelerated by electric fields, And we have huge magnets that will bend them around to keep them on the circular orbit. You see the three little quarks are a bit excited before action. And then they come from both ends. We send them in two directions. And then they come smack in the middle of where we put the detectors. And then they collide. Energy materializes in the form of various particles. And we try to catch all fragments to tell what happened. And so we, we do that happily. And our detector is built, it's like a giant camera, except that it's a pretty good one. It takes, it, uh, we have collisions every 20 nanoseconds, 20 billionth of a second we have collisions. And it's not only one proton coming here and one there, but it's a huge bundle of uh, protons in one side, same Uh, with billions of protons, like uh, uh, bee uh, swarms, and they come and they collide. And sometimes there are more than one collision at the same time, and so it gets really difficult to disentangle all that. It's a huge machine with 4,000 kilometers of cables. Here we're looking at the calorimeter from a Atlas. A calorimeter is a, a, a layer that is there to measure the energy that each fragment had. So we have 4,000 kilometers of cables and 4,000 kilometers of tubing with uh, cooling uh, fluids and uh, various gases. The whole detector is, uh, weighs 7,000 tons. That's the weight of the Eiffel Tower. But Eiffel Tower is just rusty uh, steel. 
Whereas here, like uh, my, my friend Monica Dunford said in the movie uh, Particle Fever, it's like a Swiss watch on steroids. You know, it's everything is done of ultra precise little detectors, all built by hand, assembled by hand. And for the Atlas detector, we built it under in the cavern, like we build a ship in a bottle, then it cannot come out of the air. And it's six stories high. So it's a, here is what we call the muon wheel. So it's a detector just to detect muons. I'll show uh, their role later. And it's a hell of a time to make a good selfie there. The big question uh, is how we turned on the detectors and all that, and it all worked. It was so amazing. The accelerator, the four detectors, of course, we had done some tests and all that, but the one day when we turned everything and it worked, it was amazing. And it took about 20 years to build all that concept and all that. So how did we manage to make it all work? It's a mystery. <laughs> but. Let's go back to our Higgs boson. How did we find the Higgs boson? So we excited the canvas of the universe, produced that very unstable particle, which broke apart. But I was telling you earlier that those particles were fundamental particles, the, the leptons and the, the quarks, and the bosons at the bottom, those are fundamental particles. So then they don't contain other particles inside. It's not a composite object like this. It's like when I make, uh, when a particle decay, it's like when I make change for coins. If I put a two euro coins in a change machine, and then I will receive two one euro coins, coins or they can also break into four 50 cents. 50 cents. It's not that the four 50, 50 cents were hidden inside the two euro coin. It's just that we exchanged the value of two euro for two euros in the form of four 50 cents. And so that's what happened with the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson will disappear, but its equivalent in mass and energy will reappear in the form of two Z boson, which, bosons, which are lighter, so the bosons will go fast. And then these two, in turn, will also break apart, and sometimes they can produce four muons. So in the end, we find four muons. But it could happen, too, that we had produced those four muons simply because we had produced two Z boson, which is often, much more often than the uh, uh, Higgs boson. Producing a Higgs boson took a lot of energy, but two Z boson was relatively easy. So when I find an, uh, an event like this that I took with my detector, which is like a camera, and when I have done all the analysis, I can tell, ah, I have four new ones coming out real fast, the four lines that you see in the red, that went through our giant muon wheel. If I ask you, is that, does that contain an event with um, uh, a Higgs boson or 2Z boson that were created in the first place? Nobody knows. The only way to tell the difference is by uh, looking at um, statistics. If they were only, if the Higgs boson didn't uh, exist, and we were finding events with four muons. We can count on the vertical axis. I'm putting the number of events that I'm finding, and on the horizontal axis, it's the combined mass and energy of the four muons. And you can see the theorists would tell us, oh, you should get a distribution that looks about like this. Okay, so uh, this number. But if, in addition to those Z, two Z boson, if in addition to that there is a Higgs boson, then we will see extra events appearing at, a, at the value that the Higgs boson mass has. We didn't know the mass of the Higgs boson to start with. Okay, fine. So we were shooting a lot of uh, protons and exciting ourselves and the fabric of the universe. And then, you know, we started collecting events. So each black dot is an event that we collect in our uh, detector. And you see the number are growing with time. And at the beginning, it, it 
pretty much reproduce just the red curve, but we see now that here in the, uh, sorry, in this area, we start seeing an excess uh, of events. And these corresponded to what theorists were predicting would happen if a Higgs boson had a mass of 125 GeV. So that's how we could tell on the 4th of July 2012 that we had found the Higgs boson. We started collecting data in 2011. Then 2012, we were at a higher energy and of 8 TeV, so just to see it again. And so it takes time, and you see a little excess that shows up here. And that's how we could tell we had found one, because there were more events than what was just predicted by random ZZ events. But still, when we look at an event like this, I cannot tell you this is a Higgs boson decaying into four muons. I don't know. It's just in the statistics that can tell the difference. So the lifetime of a Higgs boson is 10 to the minus 25 seconds. So you have to get up pretty early to find something to do with that. So we will probably never find any practical application for the Higgs bosons. But in around 1825, whatever, when uh, Michael Faraday was working here on electromagnetic waves, the equivalent of the uh, uh, Minister of uh, Finance came to visit him, and he was asking him, what are you going to do with that? Faraday said, no clue, but I'm sure you'll find a way to tax us on this. <laughs> and Michael Far Faraday was done right, and uh, we, d uh, we pay for that now. So why do we bother to find those particles? We bother because when we do that, we develop new technologies, new techniques. For example, the largest benefit to humanity from CERN is not the Higgs boson. Higgs boson is as useless as can be, but it's the World Wide Web. We were 13,000 physicists from 118 countries working at CERN. So of course we needed ways to communicate with each other, and that's how this need brought into play uh, that we put efforts to communicate with each other, and that was the World Wide Web. And for telecommunications, that's the same thing, all the work that Michael Faraday did on electromagnetic waves, now we put that to use. Uh, the work that physicists did on uh, uh, electrons, now we have all these uh, electronic devices that end up in the garbage. And so, yeah, so uh, computers and electronic devices, thanks to the creativity of uh, countless engineers and technicians, we have that uh, put into uh, use. Medical imaging is probably the most direct uh, uh, byproduct of the research that we do at CERN because that's the kind of techniques we use to detect uh, particles. And so x-rays and uh, computer tomography with... Uh, with um, MRI, magnetic resonance uh, imaging, all those techniques come from particle physics. There is a new one that just got invented, and it was published at CERN a month ago, and it's called spectroscopic X-ray imaging. So instead of operating X-rays at just one frequency, now they use many frequencies, so a large spectrum of X-ray uh, values, and they can do things in color as if before it was just black and white. So they can now, uh, it's cheaper than computed tomography and magnetic uh, resonance imaging. It gives, it gives better resolution, lower doses of uh, radiation to patient, and it could make uh, uh, CT and uh, MRI uh, superfluous. These are two pictures with conventional X-ray or computer tomography done on a uh, small mouse, and to the right with the spectroscopic CT. And you see, you can see the biochemical content and a better contrast. So the images are much better than we have before. So we'll have better dia medical diagnostic with that. Another technique that was developed here at the, uh, at the Royal uh, Institution by Bragg was this um, technique we call this, um, Particles like made of hadrons, like uh, protons, uh, neutrons, no, pro mostly protons, carbon with an electric charge as well, will 
deposit most of their en all their energy or most of their energy at a specific depth. So if you have a tumorous cancer, something in your liver, which is, uh, I don't know, three, four inches inside your body that this tumor is. If you were to use uh, x-rays, if we look at that here, x-rays are here, the black curve, you see that the, uh, the x-rays will deposit energy all along the way, say that our tumor is here, and so it will damage healthy tissues at the same time as zapping the tumorous cancer uh, cells. But with protons, they will deposit all their energy exactly at where we tell them to go. We can just tune where we want that. So it's a very powerful technique uh, to uh, fight cancer, and it's called hadron therapy. And this is a center that uh, CERN co contributed to building in uh, Italy. That's what patients see when they uh, go in for treatment. And this is what is behind the door, the wall that uh, nobody sees. And this, you can see uh, the touch of uh, CERN there with this uh, particle accelerator. Just about all the best things we have today come from fundamental research. Okay, and I'm going to close uh, uh, this discussion the next 10 minutes or so on have we already found everything? So especially for the young people here, that's a big question because, you know, if we've already done all the job, why would you bother to uh, study in science? Well, please, hang on. In the, con the content of the universe, we now have a good idea of what is inside the universe. Everything that we know as matter, visible matter made of quarks and emitting light when it's heated up like uh, stars and galaxies, we can see them. All that is made, uh, we call it visible matter, because it uh, emits light when it's heated up and we see it. So this visible uh, Matter only accounts for 5% of the content of the universe. So 100, 200 years of uh, work by particle physicists, and we have only understood 5% of what is there in the universe. We now know that there is dark matter, a type of matter which is five times more prevalent than uh, regular matter, visible matter. It's matter that reacts to gravitational waves. It has mass. So we can see it with uh, gravitational lenses. We can feel the effects, the presence of this mass, uh, th this matter, but we don't see it. It doesn't emit light. So we call it dark matter. And not only that, and that's 27% of the content of the universe. We have no clue what it is, no clue. We just know it's there, and we have lots of uh, ways to know that it's there. I can talk about that later if some people is, are interested. And finally, 68%, it's embarrassing, 68% of the content of the universe is in the form of uh, energy that we know nothing about, and it's called dark energy. But we know it's there because about 20 years ago, some uh, uh, astrophysicists realize that, you know that since the Big Bang, the universe is in expansion. But in fact, they realize that not only is that in expansion, but this expansion grows, uh, is always accelerating. So the expansion of the universe is going accelerating. You know that if you want to accelerate in your car or on your bicycle, you need to give energy. Where does this energy come from? No clue. But you, you can imagine that we need a lot of energy to accelerate the expansion of the universe. And that's why the dark energy accounts for so much. So all the particles that I uh, described before are only describing the tip of the, the visible part of the iceberg. And the rest is completely unknown. So we know 5% of the content of the universe, and you all, the young people who came tonight, it will be your job to find what is this 95% that is missing. So there are some good uh, job opportunities ahead. So. <laughs> There are several flaws in the standard model. There are no particle that we know of that is suitable for the dark matter. It doesn't predict anything that we could use. 
disappearance of antimatter, every time we produce matter in the laboratories, we always produce as much antimatter uh, at the same time. But, and so we know that right at, at the Big Bang, just as much matter as antimatter was produced, but it has completely disappeared from here. Many of you are saying yes, they knew that. Maybe you have seen the talk that Tara Shears gave here a few uh, years ago. It's available on the website from uh, the RI. And so it's a big mystery. We don't know what happened. There is... Uh, Disparity in the, the masses of the fundamental particles, what I was telling you before, three generations of particles with completely uh, different masses, makes no sense. The worst construction set you find on the market. <laughs> and uh, it does not include uh, gravitation. So the best theorists are hard at work, like here John Ellis, very famous physicist from CERN, a theorist, who works also here at uh, King's College, and his assistant, uh, uh, Mademoiselle Mumu, and they're, they're just you now trying to figure out what, what could it be? What, what theory would be better, or could be, what could we build on top of the standard model to go a bit further and answer those unanswered questions? And so, he has these piles of uh, papers in his office. So when I was there taking the picture, I said, but John, uh, have you read those papers? He said, I read your paper. I was impressed, okay. And then I said, uh, do you know where it is? He said, don't push your luck. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so theorists are really stuck. They come up with all sorts of theories, but we don't know if any of those theories are good. It's only when we will find new particles that we will be able to tell which one of those uh, theories was valid. Now we have no clue. The theories are producing tons of uh, uh, new ideas, but no one knows which one is true. Every time we have a small anomaly, everybody gets excited. For example, a few years ago, in the 2000, at December 2000. 16, just before the end of the year, Atlas showed some preliminary results and we were seeing already a little excess of events, you know, a bit like what I was showing for how we found the Higgs boson. You see here there's a little more events in the number of events we found and the distribution in energy for when we were looking at two photons coming out of the detector. And so pff, nobody would have been too excited especially at the end of the year when everybody wants to go on vacation. But then CMS also found the same thing. Then it was the end of the year and we always stopped the accelerator for three or four months to, for the maintenance. So we had to wait a few months before we accumulated enough data and uh, to check if this was real or not. But unfortunately, uh, it, it all uh, disappeared. It turned out to be a pile of ash. So there was nothing there, but in the meantime, the theorists got so excited. 554 papers were written to explain what could produce such things. And in fact, they came up with the weirdest things, you know, like a composite Higgs motel, grand unification theory, uh, uh, D3 brain, light stringy states, uh, there, there are uh, Wimszillas, there are Hubertron, there are all sorts of weird things that are uh, being proposed. But until we find an experimental evidence, we don't know what is there. The theorists are really, really creative trying to imagine what could work because there are tons of constraints that they have to respect. So it's unbelievable that they still managed to do 554. I'm sure that at least uh, a few hundred were really good. Right now we have a few, a handful of events, again, that are intriguing. For example, the CMS experiment found uh, events where there are jets of particle jets. When, when you have quarks coming out, quarks never come alone. They always uh, produce more quarks and we end up with a uh, a jet, uh, um, a bunch of hadrons coming out, uh, all uh, finely uh, collimated together, and we call that a jet. Uh, 
So they found some events with uh, two jets coming in one direction and two other jets. And those, each, each pair of two jets weighs about 1.9 TeV. We measure everything, the mass of a particle measure to always in energy because mass and energy are equivalent. So those are tera electron volt. It's just a, measure, a unit of energy. And so both uh, die jets have about the same mass and the other one would be 8 TeV. So it's huge. And they have two events like that that they have found. And it would be possible that a new type of boson, a Y boson, would decay into two X bosons, and each of them would decay in turn in two jets. So that would be something new and extremely exciting. But it could also happen that it comes from two Z bosons producing two jets each, and we've seen billions of those, you know. Things that were uh, winning Nobel Prizes 10, 15, 20 years ago are now just background noise that we, we're irritated with that. So we don't know what will happen. In, in physics, everything, in particle physics, everything uh, relies on uh, statistics. And so uh, we always measure, when we measure something, we also measure also the error margin. And we set our error margin, we call that one standard deviation, when we know that there are 68% chances that the real value will be plus or minus one standard deviation. Standard deviation we represent by sigma. And if we take two standard deviations, twice the error margin on each side, then we know that the real value of what we have measured, there are 95% chance that it's within that range. So uh, this is the value that I have measured, the mean value, mu we see here, and within two standard deviation, there are 95% chance that the real value is there. So in physics, we don't get excited until we have a five sigma discrepancy. Five sigma corresponds to 99.999994% confidence level. We don't want to be looking like fools, you know, saying that we found something and it turned out to be nothing. So the two events that are from CMS that I was showing earlier, if we were just to look at uh, the distribution of uh, two, di uh, two uh, four jets coming from two Z, they would roughly be distributed like this. So here is the average mass of each double pair of jets, and here for the four jet mass in total. And that would be the kind of distribution. And the extra events that are found correspond to what we would find within a one sigma value, so 68% chance that it could come from a Y boson going to X, two X bosons. So the chances are weak, but we don't have much to go on these days, so when there are little things like that, we get happy. The biggest anomaly that we have at this point is with, when we measure the W boson mass. Very recently, about a year ago, uh, the CDF experiment, which was an experiment, experiment going on at Fermilab near Chicago, they measured this mass with the highest ever precision, and it was about, they measured, uh, the mass they measured was uh, 80,433 MeV, plus or minus nine. So it's really, really precise. But the value that theorists can uh, predict from the standard model equation. There are all sorts of constraints with all the mass of the Higgs and the other particles. And they say that it should be 80,357 plus or minus six. It doesn't match. There are about seven standard deviation apart. Whoa, 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 whoa. exciting. But it will take years before another experiment. CDF is finished, so they've done that. It, it took 10 years to do their uh, calculation precisely. So they're done. And ATLAS, at uh, the Large Hadron Collider, could have only used 3% of their data, and they have an error margin of 19, which is too big to be compared to a CDF. But to do the, uh, the measurement again will take a huge amount of efforts because 
there are neutrinos involved, and neutrinos are very sneaky. That's why the little uh, character is with a mask like this, because they can go through the Earth. There are billions of neutrinos go that went through this uh, room during the time that I spoke, and they didn't even stop to say hello. So, you know, we, they, go, they go through our detectors and we don't see them. So it's, it makes the measurements difficult for the mass of the W. And plus there is this pile up uh, phenomenon that many collisions happen at the same time. So it's, it's difficult to disentangle all this. And it has to be so precise that it will take several years before we have new measurements on that. So the CMS uh, collaboration at CERN plans to use 12% of their data where there is a little less pileup, we say. Not so many events on top of each other. But it's an extremely difficult uh, measurement, so it will take a, a while before we get that. The good news is that the LHC is now running, and it's running at a slightly higher energy than before, and with higher luminosity, which means that it will have more data. So what are the benefits of that? Is that if you're working at higher energy, it's like I'm telling you, oh, there is a beautiful book hidden somewhere in a library, an ancient book with all sorts of wonderful things. And I'm giving you, finally, a taller uh, ladder so you can reach the last uh, rows of books at the last shelves. So when we were using 13 TeV, the energy of the accelerator, now we have a bit more so we can reach new particles that we were not, uh, that were not accessible before. And higher uh, luminosity means that they will have more data, so we're not limited to a small section of the library, but to a large one. So maybe we have a chance to find something new. But now it's really painstaking uh, work of accumulating billions and billions and billions of events. And uh, in the next 10 years or so, we should manage that, and maybe we'll come up with something. So here are my uh, take home messages for you before, uh, to. Uh, slowly uh, ending this lecture. So if you can remember that all matter is made of a handful of elementary particles, and those particles are the up, down quarks and the electron, but this visible matter only accounts for 5% of the content of the universe. So what we have studied only explains 5% of what is out there. There will probably never be any application for the Higgs boson, but fundamental research drives economic development and has completely changed how we live with the World Wide Web. It's a sure statement to say it has changed our lives. Electricity as well, you know, it's, thank you, Michael Faraday. And any new particle or new phenomenon that we find from now on will revolutionize in our understanding of the universe because then it will finally tell us, ah, what is this new theory that we need to add on to the standard model? So before you go, I just want to tell you that I have this book, uh, Who Cares About Particle Physics? And I, I swear, this is the best... Um, popular science book on uh, particle physics that I have ever written. And so I highly recommend to you all, and of course tonight, you know, I had an hour to explain to you all this, and with a bad accent on top of it, this is all written in absolutely proper Oxford English. So it would be much easier. And so you will learn everything about uh, the standard model, how the detectors and the accelerator works, how we work at CERN because nobody gives orders. We all go freely and do what we want, and it works. And uh, because you, you, you ask people to give their best. And then, and then uh, also about uh, diversity in science, or the lack thereof, and also the story of uh, Mileva Marichenstein, I've mentioned a few times the equation E equals mc squared. Who wrote this equation? <laughs> Everything that Albert did in the 
in the beginning of his career, was done in collaboration with his wife, Mileva Marie But this part of the story is unfortunately not known, but there is a chapter in my book on this. So I'll be offering the book at a reduced price from uh, Oxford University Press uh, tonight and a special uh, price as well for the students. So uh, if you're interested, I'll be there. And before I go, I tell you this uh, musical about Tina, Tina uh, Turner and all that. Alicia uh, Paul Moses did such a performance and such a finale and all that. And then she just, you have to see it. It's uh, amazing, you know. But I need you to help me. No, we should rock the royal institution tonight. So please join me. Stand up, all of you, please. And let's try to give a bit of spice in that lecture, you know, and <laughs> <You're so bad. laughs> that's one way to get a standing ovation. <laughs> But what I was going to tell you from Tina was, oh, oh, what's Higgs, what's Higgs got to do, got to do with it? But now I hope you can answer that question. Thanks a lot. And then I will take your questions.